welcome to the UW Computer Science and Engineering Colloquium. It's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Carlos Gestrin. Carlos is doing research uh, in the overlapping area between AI and machine learning. What I find most striking about his work is really kind of the combination of technical depth and the breadth of application areas that he's been looking at. So he got his PhD working with Daphne Nicola at Stanford, where he worked on multi-agent MDPs and learning for planning under uncertainty. Uh, before he moved to the faculty at CMU, he spent a year at the Intel Research Lab in Berkeley, where he started working on sensor networks, um, doing research on optimal placement of sensors. For that line of work, he received, I don't know the number, but a huge number of best paper awards. And he got also, in 2009, the Ichikai Computers and Thought Award, which is given every other year to the most promising young researchers in AI. He also received a PCASE Award. Um, he is currently on leave or partial leave from CMU because he also just uh, founded a startup company working on social networking. And today he's going to talk about uh, large scale machine learning. Welcome, Carlos. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dieter. Thanks for the kind introductions. It's uh, really great to be back at uh, UW for this visit. I've had a great experience meeting all the faculty and all the students. It's been really a wonderful experience. And today I want to tell you work about work of my students, uh, Yu Cheng Lo, Joey Gonzalez, uh, Joseph Bradley, Apo Kirola, and Jay Gu, and also my postdoc, Danny Bixon, and uh, some part of its collaboration with Joe Hellerstein from Berkeley. And this is really about a new abstraction for large-scale machine learning that uh, we've been working on for a couple of years now. And it's really an exciting time to be doing machine learning today. I feel like you know, it's, a, it's an awesome time. We all know about the scales of data that are out there, but I think what makes me most excited is that people actually expect machine learning to work. Like, you pull out your a web page and you, you, you type a query on it, or you, you go to Netflix and expect those recommendations to be good. And underlying it, we have to design really good machine learning algorithms that work on like large scale parallel machines, because we all know that uh, limits in um, kind of uh, the, the frequency scaling uh, problems of a process have led us to think about new kind of computer architectures. And people like me who do machine learning or machine learning experts really don't know anything about parallel machines. We don't know how to program these things. And we end up wasting a lot of time. So machine learning experts are honestly my graduate students. They, they just end up solving the same problems again and again and again. So we deal with race conditions, distributed state, communication, and so on. And because we do it so poorly, we end up with code that's difficult to maintain and basically impossible to extend, and nobody can use it. And because of that, there's been a real push, I think, uh, to think about these higher level abstractions that would allow us to deal with these large scale problems. And along the way, we all know that MapReduce has had some significant impact in this area. And these are really good for data parallel tasks. For example, if I have 7 billion images and I want to extract faces independently over each image, then that's very natural to express in a data parallel setting. And the question that I'll explore today in this talk is what is there to machine learning beyond what's uh, viable in these data parallel tasks? What can you fit within a data parallel framework and what needs new frameworks? And I'll start with a simple example, just kind of illustrate some of the potential things that you could do. And this is basically a regression problem. So I want to fit some polynomials to some data, for example. So I have some target function y that I'm interested in. And I want to have a set of basis functions, maybe polynomials of degree 3. And I want to find some weights such that I fit my data well. And in this example, which has been around for centuries, really, um, something that's been pretty exciting over the last uh, decade or so is thinking about sparse solutions to these problems. So these are problems where you try to fit the same function, but you want to make sure that most of the w's are zero, and there's only a few of these basis functions or features which are non-zero. And then you solve, that, solve those problems, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because it's more of an illustrative example, is by uh, solving the, the standard kind of least squares type of problem that you might learn about in linear algebra, plus what's called a sparsity penalty, but something that really pushes you towards a sparse solution. And this type of problem, which is called lasso problems, have had significant impact in computational biology, computer vision, compressed sensing, and all sorts of other fields. So the reason I introduced this problem is because it really illustrates some of the potential for parallelism that you can do if you think about problem-specific structure. So let me talk to you very briefly about an algorithm that is well-known and pretty natural for this problem and works well for very high-dimensional settings. 
So settings where the number of possible basis functions is very large, or the number of possible features is very large. And the approach couldn't be simpler, really. What it says is there's this function that I want to maximize, so I want to get to the bullseye of that circle. And what I do is I pick a coordinate, so for example, the x-axis, and I find the minimum of the function according to the x-axis, so maybe it goes down to this point. And next I pick another coordinate, for example, the y-axis, I go to the minimum, and proof by PowerPoint, you, you, get, you, you get to the, to the optimum here. And so one of the things that my students, um, Joseph Bradley and Apo Kirola wanted to think about and wanted to understand is what happens if you think about the same problem in a parallel setting. So the standard coordinate ascent algorithm for LASSO is called the shooting algorithm. So they propose the shotgun algorithm. And for those of you who use guns, which is not me, what shotgun would do is optimize multiple of these coordinates at the same time. So it will say, take the x-axis and y-axis and optimize it independently in parallel. So this is an example of a data parallel task because we're solving these parallel problems independently and trying to get somewhere. And again, proof by PowerPoint in this example, with two parallel processes, we can get to the optimum in one iteration. And which, which is pretty exciting, but it's not really true. And the reason it's not true is that this is the nice case where your features are uncorrelated. It's kind of like a, a, a circular problem. Where in reality, the world is a correlated complex beast. And if I try to optimize two coordinates in parallel, I might end up in a place that is worse than where I started from. So independent optimization might lead to kind of a, a bad solution which might suggest that a data parallel approach, kind of like what MapReduce uh, would do in a setting like this, might be a bad thing to do in the lasso problem. And again, the reason that I bring this illustrative example in the beginning is that some things are possible to fit within the data parallel framework, even if it doesn't seem like they're fit in there. So what uh, Joseph and Apple proved is that it is possible to achieve linear scaling. And there's some equation at the bottom for people who know about these things, but you can ignore them. It is possible to achieve linear scaling as you increase the number of processors under a certain condition. And the condition that they have is very beautiful. And it just says that if you, use, if you have parallel processors and you're allowed to use up to d over rho processors, so d is the dimensionality of the problem, so how many basis functions you have, and rho is some kind of spectral radius of the problem, where if it's a spherical problem, then rho equals one, and you can use d processes in parallel and do extremely well. While in the hard case where things are correlated, then rho can tend to the dimensionality, and you can, have, at, in the worst case, use only one processor in parallel. And so this theorem kind of characterizes when data parallel problems could be solved in a data parallel setting. And what is kind of interesting for me as well is that when you look in practice, in the x-axis as you increase the number of parallel updates, you have some prediction made by the theorem, which is this red vertical line, and you see that you get linear scaling, linear scaling, linear scaling, until you hit this predicted point, and suddenly your, your problem can become bad, or your conversions can become bad, or you can even diverge. And this is observed in, in task after task after task. And it's kind of interesting where you took a data parallel, a problem that's not necessarily data parallel, where you observe that sometimes you can frame in this sense and get a really nice algorithm. In fact, shotgun, when compared to a number of other methods, Apple, my, my, my student working here, was very keen to compare against other methods, and, and he compared against a ton of things, and he really optimized the competitors, which made their life even harder, let's say. Um, but it, shotgun is faster than these other methods in a variety of problems. Now, this was kind of a, a kind of theoretical di digression to say, I could stand over here and say, one thing that we could do with machine learning is to try to fit a lot of these problems which are hard into data parallel problems that can be solved with MapReduce and use the existing parallel infrastructure for doing that. And this might be true for a variety of problems, but what I've noticed that for a number of other problems, this provably cannot be done. So even though there's a number of people advocating the, the use of a kind of data parallel setting, I think that uh, it's interesting to see that if you have domain-specific knowledge, you can do something nice in those settings, but often you, you, you fall into significant traps in the context of machine learning. And I've been able to think about this a little bit, and with my students, we realized that many of the difficult problems 
following to what we call graph parallel tasks. So these are tasks like inference and learning in graphical models, neural networks, um, tensor factorization, which is very useful, for example, for collaborative filtering, for kind of like Netflix style problems. And in fact, uh, this is what GraphLab is most used for in industry today. And these problems tend to be hard to fit into the data parallel setting. So let's start with a running example use of graph parallelism. And this is perhaps the simplest example you can think about, so it's easy to use as a running example. This is the well-known page rank algorithm. It's basically a random walk algorithm where you say that the rank of my web page, Ri, is the weighted average of my neighbor's web pages, Rj. And so in the graph at the bottom here, uh, what you have is that the rank of uh, page 5 is updated iteratively to be the weighted average of the current estimate of the ranks for page 1 and page 4. In this case, 1 third and, and plus R4. And what you do is you iterate these updates until some convergence is reached. So one characteristic of this graph parallel problems in machine learning is that you have a graph that shows the dependency between data. In this case, it will be web page links in, in page rank kind of setting. There's some local update function that's applied on this graph, and you iterate this function again and again and again until convergence. And in graph parallel problems, we're not the first to observe that a map reduce framework is not the right framework for it. And other methods have been proposed and been explored in the setting. For example, perhaps the, the one that comes to mind most is the Prego abstraction, the, Pre the Prego approach from Google, and recently uh, Yahoo put out a, 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 a version of it called Giraffe. And as, as you might know, this is basically a framework that's called the bulk synchronous parallel model, which really goes back to Valiant in the 90s. And it's a very simple approach. It basically says I have a graph and I have a set of uh, processes that I want to do. First, I go through each node and in parallel, uh, synchronously, I do some computation among those nodes. Then every node communicates with the neighboring nodes, so all these messages get passed. You hit a barrier and you go back and you iterate. So the synchronous computation framework with the barrier is what bulk synchronous parallel settings are quite good for and this is what they're designed for. And the problem that we've observed is that this bulk synchronous model can be quite problematic for a variety of machine learning tasks. From the point of view of systems uh, kind of side that I'm sure many of you are familiar, there are some well-known uh, challenges with uh, synchronous uh, systems. When you have a barrier and you're executing a bunch of these updates in parallel, you can um, hit one of them, which can be the slowest at the current iteration, and the next uh, iteration will be a si separate slower task and so on, and your overall running time is defined by the slowest task at every iteration. And I, I, I was talking to Magda earlier, I don't know if she's in the audience now, but she looked at some of, the, of these things also in the map reduced context when you have kind of slow jobs along the way. And this is a, a well-known problem from the system side, but uh, it's also a problem from the machine learning side, not just this setting, but some kind of really significant problems that come up when you try to design machine learning algorithms that fit into the synchronous model. And in order to kind of illustrate this idea, I'm going to mention briefly an analysis that uh, my students, uh, Joseph Gonzalez and Yu Cheng Lo, did a couple of years ago, where they analyzed what's called the belief propagation algorithm, which is a standard algorithm for machine learning for some tasks. And basically, what they, they, they found out is that often there's an embedded sequential dependency between data. So there's one path of dependency, or many paths of dependency, that are hard to kind of uh, extract away. You don't know what they are until you run. And since you don't know what they are until you run, what you have to do is, as you execute this problem, you have to focus your computation in different parts of the graph along the execution in an asynchronous fashion in order to achieve good scaling. And this asynchronous fashion is well observed in, in many practical uh, applications in large scale data sets. And what I'll do is I'll show you a little video of what this kind of thing can behave in a, in a, in a simple toy example. So on the top left here, you see a noisy image. We're trying to denoise using this kind of belief propagation setting. And on the right side, you see the updates of an asynchronous algorithm that's designed in a certain way for this problem. And what you see in the beginning, you do lots of updates and you update your function everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. But as you learn something about the problem, you realize that the boundary areas are the most challenging ones. And you see the computation starts to focus only on the boundary regions. And in the end, most of your time is spent on those boundary areas. And if you can identify and focus your computation in this kind of hidden sequential area, you can do significantly better. 
And in fact, empirically, this can make a big difference. So here, I'm scaling the number of processors, and if I use a bulk synchronous parallel model, you do get great self speed ups. So you do get linear scaling as increase the number of processors, but you get linear scaling for a very bad algorithm. So to see how bad it is, if you compare it to the asynchronous solution, you'll see that the, the, the synchronous bulk synchronous model with eight processors is slower than the asynchronous solution with a single processor. And this is not just a, a kind of illustrative example, it's actually a theorem. And the theorem, which I'm not going to state here, says that asymptotically, the both synchronous parallel solution can be significantly worse than the asynchronous one. And that's really motivated a lot of the work that we started out here. And it was really impressive to see this kind of difference in performance, but there's a little bit of truth of advertisement to be done here. And the truth of advertisement is to say, yeah, we had these graphs, we had really good performance, but it was a real pain to implement this asynchronous parallel algorithm over large-scale machine learning data. And really, we, we wasted a lot of time building such system, and then if we wanted to solve another problem that required asynchronous computation, we had to start from scratch and do it all over again. And because, uh, of, because of that, and because of the realization the same ideas were useful for these other problems, we ended up thinking about whether we could build a parallel framework that made it easier to express these machine learning algorithms that require asynchronous computation, and this is where GraphLab comes in. So GraphLab is really a system designed for graph computations. Uh, they're iterative and asynchronous, and where computation can be dynamic. That means that you can focus on different parts of the problem differently as the ex execution goes by. And if you express your algorithm within the GraphLab framework, somehow we automatically take care of the parallelization issues for you, like data synchronization, optimizing data partition, and so on. And we've uh, looked at multi-core settings, distributed settings, and cloud computing pretty significantly. We're exploring a little bit of the GPU setting. And today, GraphLab is being used by, by quite a large number of people in a variety of machine learning problems. So what I'll do is spend the rest of the talk just outlining the subtraction and telling a little bit more about how we, how we perform and, and, and how, how we define our algorithms here. And this is work that Yu Cheng Lo and Joey Gonzalez have really led, uh, in addition to Apo Kirola and my postdoc, Danny Bixon, were highly involved. And Joe Hallerstein from Berkeley also participated. And the abstraction has four parts. Um, there's a graph, of course, that talks about dependency between data. There's this update function that we run on the graph. There's a scheduler that allows you to do this dynamic computations. And there's a consistency model that turned out to be quite interesting. Now, from the perspective of the graph, this is the simplest part. It's really easy to state. There's some data on the nodes. For example, it's a user's profile or a web page text. There's some basic data you put there. There's some data on the edges. There might be similarity weights in the, in the page rank kind of setting. Um, the update function is computation that runs on a particular vertex of this graph that can read and potentially modify data in the neighboring edges and the no neighboring vertices. So for example, in the page rank setting, the scope of a variable would, be, would give us access to the rank of the neighbors. Uh, the update function will recalculate my rank based on the current rank of the neighbors as a weighted average. And after I do that, if my rank has changed enough, I can reschedule the nodes that are my descendants in the graph that are based on my outward links. And here's where the dynamic computation comes in, because I only schedule what computation is needed in the simple example. So this is one simple version of dynamic computation. And to support dynamic computation, you need a scheduler. So the scheduler needs to be able to say, take whatever computation needs to happen right now, perform that computation in parallel over multiple um, CPUs, and whatever new computation that comes from that, gets re-put in the scheduler, and we iterate and we keep doing these computations in parallel as we move through it. And implementing a good parallel scheduler, as I've learned, is a pretty challenging task. And we were pretty naive about it when we started, but we ended up writing a few schedulers that are quite nice, and I think quite effective, and are pretty focused on some of the key machine learning tasks that we wanted to solve. And so you can implement your own scheduler within GraphLab if you're brave, I'd say. But uh, we do provide you with a series of them. So for example, if you look at a, a FIFO schedule, it's useful, for example, for what's called the wildfire algorithm for belief propagation. Now you can choose the priority queue scheduler, which is useful for residual BP, which is another way of solving belief propagation problems. 
Uh, or you can use a splash scheduler, which is good for the splash PP algorithm, which is another type of leaf propagation algorithm. And the nice thing is by just changing a flag in how you call GraphLab, you can run experiments for three papers with one execution. We talked about the graph representation, the update function, the scheduler. Let's talk a little bit about consistency models. So as a machine learning person, I never thought too much about consistency and what that means for parallel executions. And one type of consistency problem that we have is race conditions. So let's suppose that we're executing these red nodes in parallel and I also decide to execute the blue node. Since the scopes of these functions overlap, what can happen is one node could one vertex could modify some data in its neighbors while the other one is trying to read it and you can have this kind of clash or inconsistency or race condition. And what I, what I observed when I started looking at this, my, my own bias and what people have told me is that, oh, you know, machine learning algorithms are all statistical, who cares about consistency, everything kind of averages out, everything is approximate, and what you should do is forget consistency and get higher throughput. So more updates per second and just let the race condition things go away. And although that is true for some applications, what was kind of surprising is that for other applications, if, um, if you don't allow yourself to have consistency, consistent updates, you can have slower conversions or even divergence in your machine learning algorithm. And that's kind of an interesting, perhaps surprising observation. So as an example of this, take a collaborative filtering problem. So this is like Netflix data that uh, is well known in the field. So on the x-axis is the updates happening over time, while on the y-axis is the error. If you allow your algorithm to have race conditions, this is the kind of behavior that it can have on this data. So it can have wild fluctuations in the errors in the prediction. While if you have a race-free execution in parallel, you can actually have a very natural, nice conversions in this problem. And to, to understand an example, perhaps a simpler example of this, of how inconsistencies can come about, let's look at a page rank algorithm. So this is the one that I described as a running example earlier. And what I see here is an uh, implementation, more or less, in what GraphLab would do, where you have a reference to, to a, a vertices value. You set that reference sum to zero, and then you bring in and add in all the neighbor's contributions. This is basically how it implement page rank. And if you do this, this is the kind of performance that you get. So as you increase the number of iterations, if you do consistent updates, you, you quickly converge to the right answer. Well, with potentially inconsistent updates, you can have all these wild fluctuations and bad values along the way. And it's really interesting how these race conditions actually come about and cause these errors. And if you can see that, you can see it pretty simply here. Suppose that CPU1 is executing on the blue node, well, CPU2 is executing on the red node. And CPU2 is writing on the red node, so it's writing uh, rank is equal to zero, then rank is equal to its neighbor's value and keeps on incrementing. And along the way, CPU1 reads this partial solution. You can read very bad values. You can read a zero, you can read an intermediate answer. And that's what led to those wild fluctuations that you saw in the previous slide. So you can say, okay, there are ways of fixing this in your code. And in fact, the difference between the unstable solution and the stable solution is quite subtle and simple. In the top, you see the unstable solution where I set my reference value to zero and then I did my computation. In the bottom one, I first did the computation and then I set the center value. And so it is possible to do these modifications to get race-free operations. But the, the, the errors that I'm showing you were actual executions from traces from some of the users of GraphLab. So, this was not in my group, but somebody was using it and saying, wow, I'm having these wild fluctuations, my solutions are bad, I don't know what's happening. And they had this race condition in their code and they had turned off uh, consistency guarantees because they wanted to try to run a little faster. And so we do observe that our users perhaps are less savvy or perhaps they're just human beings, I guess, um, are less able to write code that's totally robust and sometimes you can't even guarantee robustness. So having consistent guarantees is kind of surprisingly important even in the machine learning setting. For example, here's some computer vision problems that have been explored. Um, here's what is called a, a video segmentation problem. So you have a sequence of video and you next discover that there's a segment 
that we humans think as sky, and it is consistent around different segments of the video. Even though you don't see a sky all the time, something that looks like the segment is, is present in different areas. And the way that this was being solved is using a EM style clustering algorithm and using belief propagation on a particular graph, and they had about 30 million edges in it. And a couple of like, uh, performance results that we have, um, in terms of uh, speed up, and this is a cloud result, we see the graph lab got pretty good scaling properties even in the cloud setting. And th this is what's called strong scaling or self-scaling. We, we also explored the more, perhaps more interesting weak scaling property where on the x-axis you increase the number of processors at a certain rate and you also increase the problem size at the same rate. So if it's a linear time problem and you have perfect parallel scaling, you expect a flat line here. And I can't prove to you that this is a linear time problem, by the way. But Graph Lab has a performance that's very close to flat line. There's about 10% in increase in running time as you uh, multiply the number of machines by four and the problem size by four, which is pretty cool. And since we're looking at the cloud setting, you can do all sorts of other cool and interesting things. So for example, you can explore the cost of computation. So in the beginning, as you add more machines, your computation time decreases a lot, but it doesn't cost you very much. And so there's a significant gain there. But eventually, you have this diminished returns property where adding more machines doesn't change your running time very much, but it costs you a lot more. So you can explore this trade-off of computation versus time, accuracy versus time, and a number of other things. Now, the, 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 the last application that I basically will describe here is the collaborative filtering recommender system application. And I would say that this is what most users of GraphLab today do with GraphLab, especially companies. So they're solving recommender system problems on large scale recommendation problems. And a basic algorithm for that is what's called matrix factorization type problems where you have a Netflix data and you have a set of users and a set of movies and you want to predict uh, how much a user will like a particular movie. And with Netflix data, for example, we have about 100 million edges. So it's not a huge problem, but it's a pretty decent sized problem. And we can, again, in this setting, compare Hadoop with GraphLab as you increase the number of machines. And you see that GraphLab gives you about a couple orders of magnitude uh, performance improvements over Hadoop. Now, my, uh, my postdoc, Danny Bixon, has a lot of experience with this matrix factorization problems and with MPI. And he did a problem-specific implementation of, of this for MPI. So this is an MPI version just for, for this particular matrix factorization algorithm. And the performance was very comparable to GraphLab. So the overhead here um, does not seem to be a problem. And again, since the uh, GraphLab is two orders of magnitude cheaper than Hadoop and you're paying for computation, you're about two orders of magnitude cheaper to solve it with GraphLab than you are with solving with Hadoop. So fault tolerance is always a question that I, that I get asked. And what we offer today is a checkpointing system. And the, there's different ways we can do snapshotting. So for example, in a synchronous snapshotting setting, you run GraphLab for a while, you have a barrier, you take a snapshot, you run it for a while, you have a barrier, and you take a snapshot, and so on. And we have an implementation of this. So what I'll show you the results in that. So as time passes, uh, you look in the y-axis how many nodes have up updated, how many vertices, and you see that we update vertices, update vertices until we reach some conversions there. And if we have this synchronous snapshotting, what happens is you run it for a while, then you stop all computation, and you take the snapshot, and then you run it for a while, and then you converge. So you get this extra flat line in the middle. Now, just like with uh, machine learning problems, synchronous snapshotting brings in some issues, for example, slow machines. So if, uh, if a particular machine is slow or if a particular job is slow, the, the reason you need a barrier can slow down the whole system. So if you add a, a fault or a delay, what can happen is that your, your curve will be shifted to the right for whatever that worst machine's delay was. And that can be very problematic. Now, if you're, if you're a kind of uh, a person familiar with distributed systems, you say, well, you could do a, a, dis a distributed asynchronous snapshotting technique, which is uh, less susceptible to this problem, but implementing those in parallel can be quite complex. And it turns out that we can implement, for example, the Chandy Lamport uh, asynchronous snapshotting algorithm within GraphLab using GraphLab. So this is kind of like a, a postmodern thing where we're using GraphLab to implement its own kind of robustness schema. Um, and I won't go into details for this, but I can tell you the performance is quite nice. So uh, 
when there are no failures, the synchronous snapshotting using Chani Lampard behaves pretty much the same as synchronous snapshotting. However, if you introduce these delays or failures, the, the synchronous part gets shifted to the right, but asynchronous is basically unaffected. And now I've been selling Graph Lab and telling about all this kind of amazing performance scalings that we had, but the truth is that recently, maybe about four months ago, we hit a barrier within our system development because we wanted to keep on pushing this again and again to bigger and bigger problems. And we had access to this um, Alta Vista web graph from Yahoo, which had 1.4 billion vertices and 6.7 billion edges, and we wanted to brag about it. And GraphLab just would not run on it. It would not work. And we, we went and we investigated what was happening, what was the issues, and we realized that what we have here is what's called a natural graph. And natural graphs have very interesting properties. For example, in this one, 1% 1 of the vertices are, is connected to about 53% of the edges. And that can affect our, our process in very significant ways. And we can observe these high degree nodes in many settings. In social networks, you might have a very popular person. In um, user recommendations, you might have a popular movie. In machine learning, you have these uh, hyperparameters which touch a lot of the data. And uh, in uh, kind of data, uh, text analysis, you can have words like Obama that appear in a lot of documents. And so this can be very problematic because it really is an issue of what, how our abstraction is defined. If I have a vertex that has many neighbors, I have to lock all the data in all of these neighbors and I have to acquire all the information from all of them and hold on to those locks and kind of really slow down parallelism. So it really can limit parallelism in a significant way, but perhaps the most significant part that stopped us from solving this big Alta Vista problem was um, the communication constraints that evolved with this setting. So if I have a distributed system, what I'm doing is I'm cutting the graph and I'm putting some vertices on one machine and some vertices on others. And if I have a high degree node, it means that the communication I have to do is order of the number of neighbors. And this can be very large if you have very high number of neighbors. And because of that, we've recently updated the graph lab abstraction in two ways. One is a new factorized update functions, and the other one is uh, exposing more asynchrony in the update functions. So I'll very briefly mention these two ways because it's kind of fun to see what happens with them. So decomposable or factorized update functions uh, means that we, we split the update function into a, a gather scatter kind of procedure, where if I'm vertex y, rather than uh, locking up my neighbors, I, I incorporate the contribution of each neighbor one at a time. And here my assumption is that the update function is commutative associative. And that's true for several kind of update functions, not for all. And once I've done that, I get some delta or change, which I then apply to the center node, to the center vertex, and I go back and I distribute any kind of information that I need to my, to my neighbors using a kind of scatter operation. So not all update functions are associative commutative, but for example, page rank is. And here, the gather operation is just computing the update contribution from my neighbor, merge is simply a sum, application is just changing my rank, and scatter is just scheduling whatever other vertices I have to schedule based on how much my value has changed. And the very nice thing about uh, the scatter gather abstraction is that it really significantly decreases the co cost of communication. So now when I cut my graph, what I can do is run the, the gather operation part of the update function in parallel independently on each machine. Then I communicate the summaries from each machine. So this is a order one transmission on the network instead of order of number of neighbors. And this is what makes all the difference. I then compute my apply operation, which I then do with each vertex. And then locally, I do the, the, the scatter. Now, this is a different uh, parallel model, and there's different consistency guarantees here, which we can discuss in detail, but I won't have time to go into a lot of detail here. But it does allow us to run even sometimes vertices which are neighbors in parallel at the same time. And a number of different algorithms fit into this scatter gather framework. So for example, those of you familiar with belief propagation, you'll see that gather corresponds to multiplying in the products of all the messages into the vertices. Apply corresponds to changing my belief, and scatter corresponds to computing the outgoing messages in parallel. For 
collaborative filtering Netflix data types of problems, the update functions are more interesting. Again, won't go into a lot of detail, but they correspond to matrix operations. And here's pretty nice because the gather is the sum of terms in a particular matrix, while the apply is a matrix inversion and matrix multiply. So this can be very interesting and elaborate operations, but they still fit into the framework. Now, in terms of, of results in this case, what I'm showing here is the running time versus error. And you see that with full updates, you get a slower conversions than you get with factorized updates. So factorized updates are really helping the conversions of the approach, even in this kind of simple page rank type problem. Now, factorized updates are not enough. They don't expose all the parallelism that we want to expose. So here's an example. Suppose that something changes on that red node on the left, and I start propagating it through the graph. When I hit Y, I have to gather information from all my neighbors, and even the gather can be a very slow operation. And to address this, we can exploit first the commutative associative properties of the update function. So we have the previous values of the edges, blue, 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 and the new value, red. I can reorder them, and now, if your function, if your update function, in addition to being commutative associative, has a minus operation, so it forms a, a, a billion group, then what you can say is that the red update is a combination of the blue update plus some delta. And instead of computing all of the update, you just compute the delta and you keep cache the old values from all of your neighbors. And now your update functions, instead of recomputing things, they propagate this delta along the graph and they can be significantly faster. So not all of the update functions I described in the first half of the talk fit into the factorized update model, and not all the factorized update functions fit into this delta billion group kind of setting, but many do. So page rank does, so does belief propagation, matrix factorization, LDA, uh, among others. Now, going back to the problem that I described just a couple minutes ago, if I use Prego, or, or a bulk synchronous model, as you increase in the running time, your convergence is pretty slow. And you see these bumps here, they're because of the barrier, basically. That's what's happening there. If you use the full updates from the first half of the talk, you get a significantly faster convergence. Factorized updates help, but delta updates make all the difference. And this is, uh, this is in the um, multi-core setting. We also have a prototype implementation now in the distributed setting, where we see the full updates give us a significant boost. And part of the reason, perhaps the most significant reason here, is the amount of communication that you need for delta updates is significantly lower as you increase the number of, of machines you're processing on as compared to uh, full updates. And that was the example I was talking about in the beginning, where I said that uh, we really needed to decrease the communication time or the communication amounts that you have to do. Now we can go back to, to this large web graph problem that we couldn't solve with GraphLab, and it turns out that now we can actually solve. So this is, has 1.4 billion vertices and 6.7 billion edges, and with Hadoop, it was taking about 9,000 seconds to, to uh, compute page rank on this graph with 800 cores. And we have a prototype implementation, which is still very inefficient, of GraphLab 2 with factorized and delta updates, and we see that with 500 cores, it takes us about 400 seconds. So what I've talked about so far is the, the factorized update functions is showing kind of how to bring in parallelism in terms of the update functions, while delta updates are really bringing asynchrony into the update functions themselves, not just when you schedule the processors, but what edges or what parts of the update functions get recomputed. Now, this, uh, uh, this changes that we've recently done in GraphLab are really a, a reflection of a number of lessons that we've learned in the building of the system. It turns out that asynchronous computation in machine learning can make a big difference over synchronous computation. And dynamic computation has really a lot of potential, though there's still some really strong theory to be made in terms of machine learning to prove things about dynamic computation. Um, it turns out also that consistency is fundamental for many machine learning problems. It's not just a kind of a theoretical construct, but it's something that is required for convergence. I've also learned a lot about building systems, which I knew nothing about, I think, <laughs> in doing this process. But for example, um, thinking about abstractions and, and rethinking how we deal with our graph representation and so on as we try to scale to bigger problems. But honestly, most of the decisions that we've made recently and the changes are really based on 
user questions and feedback that we've gotten from a, a, a growing community of people using GraphLab. And this has been a very nice community for us with a number of different people. So there's four startups that really actively use GraphLab in their core business, and I've, I only own one of them. Um, <laughs> The, there, there's a number of different companies which are experimenting, helping us, participating, or just downloading GraphLab, and there's a number of different academic projects which are actively using GraphLab. Um, we released the open source code about middle of last year, and we've had like 2,000 plus downloads, so it's been very nice to see uh, this approach in action. So if you're really interested to try it, you can go to graphlab.org and um, start exploring from there. So let me take the, the last five minutes here to talk about where this is going and, and where my efforts are going, and a little bit more about the type of work that we do here. So within GraphLab, I think the most exciting thing for me is to work on this kind of core design limitations that I, we brought into the system. Today, GraphLab is defined for the batch setting, where given a graph, you do some computation, you get some predictions out. But for those of you who use things like Facebook, you know that new users are coming in, you're making new, fr new friends, and you're defriending people all the time. <laughs> and so the graph shouldn't be thought about as this batch static thing, but really almost like a database system. Data is coming in, and streams of qu queries are coming in. You're continuously doing predictions, you're continually doing friend recommendations, and building a, a, a large scale system that can do that within large scale machine learning, I think, is a very exciting task. And I, I've been thinking about that as a uh, real-time version of GraphLab, an interactive version of GraphLab. Now, this uh, GraphLab really represents perhaps half of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the you know, 1.5 effort that I put into 150% of my effort. Um, the other half is uh, thinking about how to take large-scale information from the human perspective rather than from the computer perspective. And on this part, we're dealing with the fact that we're constantly overloaded with huge amounts of information. There's just too much stuff out there. And the tools that we use today are very limiting to dealing with this information. Basically, we can type some keywords on Google, for example. Or oh, since I'm in Seattle, I should say on Bing. Um, and I get a set of documents out. And if I don't like those, all I can do is go back and change my keywords. And this can be, I think, a very limiting way to interact with large-scale information. So I think that the effort that we've been thinking about is new ways to phrase complex information needs, new ways to output information that's not just a list of documents but more structured outputs, and new ways to learn a user's preference from interaction from data. And I, I'm not going to talk too much about learning user's preferences, but let me uh, show to you briefly what I mean by the top of this, of this graph, just in one minute. So there are two domains that I've been thinking a lot about. One of them is scientific literature. So it was said that about two and a half centuries ago, there will come a time when it will be easier to go into nature and measure something than it is to find a book that has the answer to that question. And my claim is that that time is now, it's today. With the overwhelming number of papers and conferences and books and so on, I just can't keep track of what's going on. And we're basically reinventing things all the time. And what we do need is new ways for, for scientists to interact with large-scale scientific literature. And an example of that that we worked on recently was to say, here's the articles that you've read so far, and a model that we bring in for what influence means in, a, in, a, in scientific literature, and formulate this as a modular function optimization problem, which is something that uh, I've done quite a bit of work on, and use that to provide the users with a diverse set of articles that they might want to read about their research. Now, of course, if you do this, you might get a set of articles from, say, the Southern Brazilian Symposium on Evolutionary Computing, which you may or may not care about, unless you're Brazilian. Um, and we want to bring in your preferences. And one way of thinking about this is to say, oh, here are the papers I like, here are the papers I don't like, which can be quite problematic and slow. And what my student, Kali De Lorini, uh, realized is that you can actually look at somebody's BIPTEC file and use that to build a model of what kind of literature they're interested in reading, and use that to give them personalized recommendations. And through, through a very interesting and detailed user study, he demonstrated that he can get more useful, more trustworthy, and more relevant and diverse recommendations by using his system. And I think that the, the most rewarding part of this was to say that every 
subject of his user study afterwards came back to us and said, what were those papers that you showed us? Because I really could have used them in the doing of my thesis. So it's, it's kind of fun to do that. And so this is one aspect, one domain that I'm very excited about. The other domain that I'm pretty excited about is understanding the structure of news, understanding the structure of political discourse, or you think about it as connecting the dots. And as an example of that, my student Daphna Shahaf explored the idea that, for example, you can think about the housing bubble and the bailout bill, and intuitively, the two events ex connect are connected to each other, but it's hard to understand that with keyword search in Google. So what she was able to do is say, it give me two New York Times articles, for example, one about the housing bubble, the other one about the bailout bill, and what she does is output a set of New York Times articles that you could read that really understand how one event led to the other. So from the, from the housing bubble, it, it led to mortgage crisis and the effects it had on banks and the reaction that Congress had to that, to the bailout plan, to the, to the bailout bill. And so here again, um, the approach is uh, an optimization-based approach where we, we explored algorithms with theoretical guarantees and we did a number of user studies where she showed that users can learn about a topic more quickly using the kind of data that you get out of such system. And in this aspect of my work, a motivating long-term example which I've mentioned to several of you is what are called issue maps. So this might be an information overload in itself, but it's really a, a poster that was built by somebody by hand. And it took a lot of time, I think thousands of, of hours to build. And the way I interpret it is it takes a query, can computers think, finds a set of related important documents, these are important articles about the topic, and annotates them with, with relations between them. So if I zoom in, what it's done here is, for example, there's an article that says, computers can't think because machines can't have emotions which is supported by these other articles that says the concept of feelings only apply to living organisms, which is then disputed by this one that says we can imagine building artifacts with feelings. And I have a cell phone, and I can tell you, my cell phone has feelings, for sure. <laughs> and the question here is, if I could do this inter interactively for any query in a personalized way, I think I can really help, I think we can really help guide people or how they exploit science and how they do this, they go through the kind of scientific studies. And I think this is very interesting. So kind of just to close, um, extracting large scale information for web is pretty exciting, but really more generally, machine learning is pretty exciting today. It's a very exciting time to be doing machine learning. You have this huge data sets and you have all these people who think machine learning works. And it has worked really well and it has had a lot of impact in people and it has an impact as we deal with this large-scale data. And the two problems that I talked about, these two pillars for me, are really dealing with this context of a kind of exciting work in machine learning. One of them is how to design algorithms that scale to very large problems, and the other one is thinking about how users interact with this huge scale of information that we're faced with every day. Thank you very much. How well do your scheduling algorithms scale up to big machines, scale up to big data? Well, does it scale to part of the processors? Uh, you're asking for the scheduling component of GraphLab. Yeah. How, how, how well does the scheduling component of GraphLab scale up to large problems? So the, the truth is to make uh, scheduling work across machines um, in an effective way is, is non-trivial. And we use a bunch of tricks and make it possible to do things like 1.4 billion vertices. Things like we don't really have a FIFO queue. We have some you know, distributed prioritized schedulers that are approximately prioritized and they do work stealing. They do some interesting things to make it uh, work in a, in a kind of large scale parallel setting. So the answer is, yeah, they, they, they scale, but it was a lot of work. And the idea is like machine learning experts won't have to do that. Only one person has to suffer through them. Do you really think that the abstraction is there, or is this still the research that's going to lead up to... The way that I think about it is you specify the update function a certain way, and you make a few choices for your algorithm, and that's the interface between you and parallel machines. And as a machine learning expert, that abstraction and that interface is what shields you from everything else. So you don't have to think about how the scheduler is implemented, or like how consistency guarantees are implemented. You tell me which ones you want, and we give you a certain performance which tends to be very good, but it's not always going to be very good. So you are going to be able to kind of experiment a bit with that interface layer, with that 
kind of abstraction layer and maybe get better performance for yourself, but it will shield you from a lot of the other stuff that goes on underneath. So it is a narrow waste, in a sense, abstraction is a narrow waste, but it's not like a, I don't know what a zero width narrow waste would be, but it's not, you know, totally, totally thin. Uh, yeah. Well, this is sort of a follow-up to that. Um, have you uh, built any tools into GraphLab that help people design graphs that have, that can mix rapidly for MCMC or this sort of thing? Like for a user who's just creating a model, they might not be an expert in machine learning. They might not know what graphs will sort of be easy to optimize. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the question here is, have we built any algorithms that try to uh, design graphs which are, you said good for, for, for mixing in MCMC, but let me just rephrase your question, for good for parallelism. For parallelism, yeah. Yeah, and, and um, the answer is no, but I think it's very exciting. And in fact, uh, Joe Gonzalez, my student, has put this, this as part of his thesis proposal to say, can I learn, can you design a machine learning algorithm that learns structures and models that are good for parallelism? And I think that that's a, a significant open problem in my field that uh, I think uh, somebody has to address. And it's not going to be addressed by one paper. It's just like really new thinking about machine learning in the setting. So the answer is exciting stuff to do. Um, anybody else? Question. So there's also a lot of work going like for deep belief networks, for example, on GPU implementations for inference and learning. Do you see a chance of how graph that will connect to those kind of things? So, so um, the question is about deep belief networks and GPUs. Let me separate these two things. Um, there is currently some people implementing deep belief networks within GraphLab. I haven't seen any work uh, comparing GPU implementations of those algorithms with GraphLab implementations of those algorithms. I can tell you that implementing anything in the GPU is a royal pain, um, and I don't want any machine learning person to ever have to touch CUDA in their lives. So, um, uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I may say that, you know, in that context, I would not be surprised that it is possible to implement something in a GPU that would perform very well or extremely well, but, you know, you and I sitting together could probably name one 0.5 people in the world who can do that with deep lift networks. And I think that that's kind of the scope of people who are possible to do it. Well, GraphLab makes it accessible to kind of a wider range of people. So I have my doubts, and I'm sure that the, any architecture folks here will argue with me, but potentially I have my doubts as to what architectures are going to win. And just the programmability of GPUs is just very challenging for the types of graph parallel problems that we have. Yeah, then. So. Partly related to this question and looking forward a bit, a question that, may, that I don't know if you've asked yourself is, what kinds of computer architectures right, would be good for doing large-scale parallel machine learning? Right? right now, what we're doing is working with existing architectures and doing things like GraphLab to do better on them. But you know, big data and analytics is a large enough driver that machines could be designed for the purpose. And then the question is, if you agree with that, what would they look like? Right. Uh, I think uh, if I could answer the what they would look like question, I'd be pretty famous today, right? But um, uh, I think, uh, you know, I've talked to a number of arch architecture folks who have talk talked and explored these questions. Um, Mark Horowitz at Stanford, for example, has thought about it, and Kunle there too, and I had had extensive conversations, and I would say that um, there is no answer that I see yet that I'm convinced about. I know that there are some proposals out there. Um, I just don't know yet what the answer is. And I don't think I, I have enough kind of fit in the ground on that, on computer architecture to be able to make a compelling case. I would be happy to talk to people and kind of you know, bounce ideas, but I don't know if I have the answer to that question. Thanks again. Thanks a lot.